Okay, let's get started. Uh, let's talk a little bit about where we are and where we're heading. We are working our way through the brief, admittedly brief history of evolutionary robotics, which started back uh, in the early 1990s. Um, last week we were talking about the minimal cognition experiments, where we tried to minimize the complexity of the robots and their environments. We had these little circles moving around in a two-dimensional uh, physics engine that had minimal physics in there. And we were trying to boil things down to the absolute minimum and then see whether we could evolve for those minimal robots, the building blocks of cognition. And we looked at four of them last week. What were those four? You're going to use one of them right now to call up those four. Selective attention. Selective attention is one. Um, anybody else help them out? Memory. memory, right? You've got to use memory. All right. Selective attention, memory. What are we missing? Self, non-self. Distinguishing between self and non-self, right, seems trivial to us. Not so easy when you're starting out. What was the fourth one? What was the task in that fourth one? Threading the needle was the experiment which tested the robot's ability to perceive affordances, right? The gap relative to myself. What sorts of interactions are possible between me and the gap? In order to figure that out, I need to use a, uh, an adverb. It is threadable or passable or not passable or, or what have you, right? Okay, so uh, today we're going to talk about a fifth building block of cognition, which is categorization, right? Friend from foe, the poisonous berry from the nutritious berry. If you want to get around in the real world, you need to be able to take all of this complex sensory stimulation that's falling on my eyes and my ears and my other senses and boil and see the pattern in all of that data, right? And that pattern is going to be categories, right? This blob of stimulation out here belongs to this category, and this blob of perception out here belongs to this other category. Okay, we'll get back to lecture 10 uh, in a moment. Hopefully we can finish lecture 10 today and move on to lecture 11. So in the early days of evolutionary robotics, when these minimal cognition experiments were going on, physics engines were introduced in 2000. Um, and they were very rapidly adopted by robotics, and you can sort of, uh, you have first-hand experience for why now. So there was another stream of research that started to build these not-so-minimal robots, right? These legged robots inside of a 3D physics engine where that robot was beholden to the laws of physics like momentum and gravity and friction and inertia and so on. And there were some initial experiments to study, could we get a robot to get from point A to point B? So if you want to be able to act intelligently in the real world, one of the things you're going to have to be able to do is move from point A to P point B. So in lectures 11 and 12, we're going to really focus on this issue of uh, movement. OK, before, I do, uh, before we do, let's talk a little bit about uh, the assignments. So we'll talk about assignment uh, 7 in a moment. For the graduate students, hopefully you have submitted your uh, final project ideas. There were a number of questions about whether you can change the deliverables as you go and even the idea uh, itself. That's perfectly fine for us and it's pretty natural that as you start to dig into your final project you realize that maybe some of your deliverables were a little too ambitious or were easier to implement than you thought. That's perfectly fine. Just make sure that whenever you submit your weekly deliverable to us in Blackboard, you write in a little bit of text there clarifying where you are in your project. Right? I promised last week that I would implement deliverable 2, which was x, but I've changed deliverable 2 to y, because y, is a, I see now, is a better step towards the, my, my final goal. As long as you give us a rationale for why you're changing your idea, your deliverable, that's, that's fine with us. Any questions from the grad students about final projects? Uh, again, it might be a good idea to come and see me during my office hours, or at the minimum have an email exchange with me about your idea, and we can talk about whether it's, it's feasible or not. OK, let's talk about uh, assignment seven now. So uh, for the undergraduates, you have just implemented uh, the hill climber, which is the simplest of all possible search algorithms. 
where we have a single parent and that parent is producing a child. If the child is more fit than the parent, it replaces it. Otherwise, the child dies off. In the parallel hill climber assignment, as you can probably imagine, you're now going to have a population of parents, P1, P2, through Pn. You maintain a population of these. And at every generation now, each parent produces its own child. And same thing for each of the ith parents. If its ith child has higher fitness, it replaces the ith parent. Otherwise, the ith child uh, dies off. So in the process of implementing the parallel hill climber, when you get to step uh, 35 here, you're going to be introducing a new class, not surprisingly called uh, population. This class inside of it is going to contain a dictionary. So if you're not familiar with Python dictionaries, you might want to go read up uh, on those. It's going to maintain a dictionary, and every, every entry in that dictionary is going to contain an individual, and those individuals will produce children and so on. So let's actually draw what our class hierarchy looks like so far. So down towards the bottom we have, uh, or sorry, at the, at the top for you at the moment, we have a class called individual. And that class has a number of functions or methods associated with it. And it also has a number of variables or other data structures or other classes associated with it. What is stored inside of individual? What does individual contain? An instance of robot. An instance of robot. What else? Instance of simulation. Instance of the simulation, yeah. So the simulation in which the robot is going to be evaluated. What else are we missing here? Two more items are important to define an individual. The fitness value. The fitness value, right? So once we place the robot in the simulator and we get back sensor data, we're going to calculate the fitness of that robot. Still missing one piece. Genome. The genome, right? So let's put that, let's put that over here, right? So the genome contains information about the brain of the robot. Robot contains all the information about the body. We take the brain and the body together, drop it in the simulation. The robot does its thing. We calculate its fitness, and away we go, right? So you can now probably guess how this population data structure, uh, this population data structure is going to look like. It's going to be a dictionary, and it's going to contain multiple individuals, I1, I2, through IN. And each one of these individuals has its own simulation, robot, genome, and fitness. Make sense? OK, pretty, pretty straightforward. OK, so you're going to be adding another layer to your class hierarchy in this assignment. You're also, we're also going to be introducing a new idea in this uh, assignment, which is uh, the, the ability to run multiple simulations in parallel. So when you evaluate either all of the parents, P1, P2, Pn, or all of the children, C1, C2, or Cn, if you're able to on your laptop, you're going to actually run all of these simulations in parallel. When you do, you, the first time you run it, you're going to do it with the graphics turned on. And if you do, you'll notice that you'll open a bunch of windows in parallel. And you can actually see, in this case, a population of five robots all being evaluated in parallel. OK. Now, this works fine. For most modern laptops, if you have a multi-core architecture, if you have an older laptop, this might not work so well. So let's just have a look. Uh, I'm going to make an exception in this case and actually show you a little bit of code. Here's the evaluation function for the population class, right? this one. And so not surprisingly, inside this evaluation function, we're going to iterate over each of the if uh, individuals in this population. And we're going to start up all of these evaluations. So you'll notice that we're iterating through this and starting them up. Now we have, in this case, all five running. They're all running in parallel. Our, our program continues on to this loop 
gets here and is now waiting to compute the fitness of the first individual in the population of five. But those five individuals are still running, so the program uh, execution will pause here until the first simulation ends and returns sensor data. It'll digest that sensor data and compute the fitness of the first individual. By the time it's finished that doing that, the second individual has probably finished. It digests the sensor data from the second simulation and onward through the five. Make sense? Okay, so that probably for all of you, that'll probably work fine if you have an, a population of five that are running in parallel. If you create a population of 50 individuals and start up all 50 in parallel, you might start to see a significant slowdown or other issues with your laptop. So um, you can turn off the parallelism here if it's causing your laptop a problem and just evaluate one individual after another in serial rather than in parallel. Doesn't matter to us. Um, there's no grades here for demonstrating to us that you evaluated your parallel hill climber in parallel. Is it just as useful to do it in blind mode? You definitely will want to do it in blind mode. So you're going to start out by running it uh, with the graphics turned on just so you can actually see that you've got five different robots that are being evaluated in parallel. Once you've done that, you'll turn off the graphics and run them all with the graphics turned off. Even with the graphics turned off, when you have a significantly large population size, some of your laptops might, uh, might have a problem. Okay, so given this four lines of code here, how would we turn off the parallelism? How would we change these four lines of code so that now we evaluate just one individual after another? Just have one for loop. Just have one for loop. That's it, right? Now, if I were to run the code, we wouldn't see five windows in parallel. We'd see one evaluated after another, right? We enter the for loop. We start up the evaluation of the first individual. And now we wait for the first individual to finish and compute its, fit, its fitness. When it does, back up here, start up the second one, wait for the second one to finish, and so on. So if you are working your way through this assignment and you start to hear your fan going like crazy on your laptop, uh, you might consider just turning off the parallelism. It's up to you. Any questions about that? OK. Any other questions about assignments, final project, before we carry on? OK, so back to uh, lecture 10, active categorical perception. Uh, last time, we actually saw the first slide from lecture 10, where we were introducing this idea of active categorical perception, or ACP. And ACP is a wonderful thing, because it demonstrates one of the uh, important aspects of embodied cognition. Remember back to the beginning of the course, we took all the different approaches to creating intelligent machines and we broke them into two camps. The disembodied approach, which is mostly machine learning and, and uh, data mining, where the idea is to create an intelligent computer. But that computer ultimately cannot push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Then we looked at robotics, which is sort of the embodied approach to creating intelligent machines, where the assumption in all embodied approaches is that in order to create intelligent machines, they're going to have to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Nothing makes that point more clear, I think, than ACP. Because if you observe your world, if you were just to look passively at these 11 objects, there is no clear category here, right? There is a gradation in geometry from the circle to the diamond. However, the moment you have an arm and you can reach out into the world put your palm on top of the object and move your palm back and forth across the top of the object, something magical will happen, which is suddenly a category will appear. Some of these objects will be rollable, and there's our affordances coming back as well, right? And some of these objects will be slidable. They will not roll, but they will slide with your palm. Where does this category boundary occur? between the third and fourth object, between the eighth and ninth object. It's not a well-posed question, right? 
Why not? Rollable is kind of a vague term. Rollable is a very specific term, right? It's that you're definitely going to know whether the object rolls or not. I mean, in theory, you can roll a cube. If you have a Rubik's Cube, you can just drag it across or have it... You could roll. cause a cube to roll under what conditions? Enough force. Enough force, right? Maybe the way you press against the object, the way in which you actively manipulate the object is going to matter. What else is going to matter? Not just how you manipulate the object, but... Shape the object. The shape, the shape of the object itself, some things are going to be harder to get to roll than others. What else? So you're all physics engines experts by now. What am I leaving out? The surface you're rolling it the over. The surface you're rolling it over, right? Is the table covered in ice or is it covered in sandpaper, right? So these categories will emerge, but their categories will be different depending on the environment, right? The category is not inherent in the object itself. It's emerges from all these other interactions, the way in which you manipulate the object, uh, the shape of the object, what's the texture of the object, is the object covered in sandpaper or ice, what surface are we rolling it over, and so on. Right? So categorization is a tricky thing because it always depends on, on context. Nonetheless, it will emerge once you start to physically interact with objects. Right? Okay. So what is, uh, what is the, the goal of this interaction? Well, if you do reach out and try and manipulate objects, you're creating this feedback loop between you and your environment. And you're trying to figure out what are the categories out there in the world, right? Which objects can I sit on and which ones can I not sit on? Um, young children, the category they're usually interested in is what can I put in my mouth and eat and what can't I, right? You put a very young child uh, among a bunch of objects, the first thing they'll do is grab it and try and put it in their, their mouths, right? There are very specific ways that learners interact with their environment to try and reduce within category differences. Here's a whole bunch of things in front of me. They're all different shapes and sizes and colors. But these I can get in my mouth, and these I can't, right? So by manipulating these objects, you're actually reducing these within category differences. What's rollable, what's edible, and what's not. And in some cases, you're also manipulating these objects to magnify the difference between categories, right? You're, tr you're having a conversation with someone, and you're not quite sure whether they're friend or foe. You, the way in which you talk to them might elicit certain responses from them that help you categorize or figure out are they with you or against you. Right? Okay, so we're going to see some examples of this in a moment. ACP is interesting for these reasons, but also there's a, a theory out there in developmental psychology that says children perform a lot of ACP. They'll grab and try and break or eat anything near them. And by learning about the world through ACP, you gradually build up the ability to perform passive categorical perception, right? So I can luckily look around this room and figure out what's edible and what's not without having to go and actually take a bite of your apple or a sip of your, your coffee, right? So somehow ACP perform, provides the scaffolding or the beginnings will help me to learn about categories to the point where I can start to categorize objects in my environment without physically acting upon them or interacting with them. Okay, but let's walk before we run. Let's have a look at a robot here that's going to be evolved to perform active categorical perception. Now, we're sort of moving outside of uh, minimal cognition experiments. This robot arm is definitely not uh, minimally complex. It's a relatively complex robot, so let's work our way through it. You can see that we've got a robot arm here and a robot hand. Uh, the arm has J1 through J7 uh, in it. What does the J stand for? The joints, right? If you look carefully, you'll notice that these cyan-colored cylinders representing the joints have particular orientations. What do the orientations of those cylinders tell you? Rotation. The rotation, right? So they're telling you something about the joint normal. You'll notice there are two in the shoulder, and I think we've talked about this before. If you want to simulate something like our shoulder joint, you can put two hinge joints together, one which rotates my arm relative to my torso like this, 
and the other one which rotates my arm relative to my torso like this. And then as these two joints are uh, actuated, you get this kind of motion. What about this one here? This is kind of an odd one. It looks like it's in the middle of the upper arm, and the, uh, the long axis of the cylinder is parallel with the upper arm. What does that mean? It could mean that, right? So this could be a linear actuator that the arm can become longer or shorter. They're trying here to actually create uh, an anthropomorphic robotic arm. So an arm that's as close to anthro or as close to human as possible. So it's not, we can't lengthen or shorten. It's doing this, right? So this is a good trick to remember. If you take two cylinders and put them end to end, take two cylinders and put them end to end, and you place the joint normal of the joint that connects those two cylinders parallel, these objects will roll about one another, right? So J3 is simulating our ability to do this motion. Okay, so we've got shoulder, upper arm, elbows pretty straightforward. Same J5 at the forearm allows us, to, is this motion, and J6 and 7 is this and this, right? Okay, so that's seven joints in the arm. There are a total of, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Actually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fifteen joints in the hand, which allows this, right? Okay, those are all the motors. We'll come back to uh, we'll come back to the sensors in a moment. Questions? We're good. Okay. So what is the robot going to do? How are we going to teach it ACP? Well, we're going to expose the robot to two different objects: a sphere and an ellipsoid. You'll notice that the minor, the major and minor axis of the ellipsoid are almost the same. So this ellipsoid looks, or more importantly, from the robot's point of view, feels very similar to the sphere. And we're going to try and train this robot. We're going to place an object in front of it. It's going to reach out and physically manipulate that object. And the robot is going to have to tell us, did we give it a sphere or the ellipsoid? That's the task. OK. How are we going to evolve the robot to do that? Well, like always, we're going to take an artificial neural network, drop it inside this robot, see what the robot does. And based on its behavior, we're going to reward fitness for being able to tell us through its motion, whether it's in the presence of a sphere or an ellipsoid. OK. We're going to actually evaluate each neural network, uh, let's see, uh, 16 times. We're going to start by placing the robot's arm in initial position A. And we're then going to place this object under the palm and let the robot do its thing. When it finishes, we're going to put the arm back to position A, then take this object and place it underneath the palm and let it do its thing, then this object, then this object, then this object, this object, this object, this object. From the robot's point of view, there are eight different objects, but we know that the first four exposures are the sphere, and the second set of four exposures is the ellipsoid, but placed at different orientations under the robot's palm. So we're actually exposing it to the same object under different orientations. In the case of the sphere, there is no different orientation, so it's just the, the same placement. So that's evaluating the neural network eight times. Then we're going to take the robot's arm and move it to initial position eight, and then re-expose it to all eight objects, giving us a total of 16 trials for each artificial neural network. And in each of those 16 trials, we're going to ask it at the end of that trial, is it a sphere or ellipsoid? And it's going to tell us. If it's right, it gets some fitness. If it gets it wrong, it doesn't. So far, so good? OK. So that's the body of the robot and the task. Let's have a look at the brain of the robot. Let's start with uh, the figure, and then we'll move on to the math. So the figure should look pretty familiar to you by now. We have uh, an, a, an array of sensor neurons down here. We have a total of 22 of them. We then have, uh, we have uh, eight internal neurons, which you've heard of as hidden neurons. And then a total of 31 through 48 
output neurons. Neurons 31 through 46 are motor neurons. They're going to control the joints in the robot. Neuron 48, uh, 47 and 48 are special. They're categorization neurons. And we're going to read off those neurons to see whether the robot thinks the current object is a sphere or an ellipsoid. So far, so good? OK, let's work our way through this now. Let's start, with, um, let's start with the sensors. So we have seven proprioceptive sensors in the arm. Remember, we have seven joints in the arm. So there's a proprioceptive sensor in each of the joints. What does a proprioceptive sensor tell us? Position. The position, right? The position of that joint or the angle of that, that joint. That one's pretty straightforward. We have 10 tactile sensors. Where do you think those 10 tactile sensors go? In the hand, right? So if you count them off, you can see them on the hand there, one through 10. One in the palm, that's pretty important. One in the thumb, and then two apiece in the other four fingers. OK. Uh, and also hand proprioception. Yes? How come it's not mentioning the mid joint? So it, it, it mentions the, the base joint, like the knuckle. Yep. And then it mentions the end joint, but not the ones in the middle. Uh, so you'll notice, right, so there's three rows of joints here. So there's joints here, here, and here. Yeah. We're not getting proprioceptive information back from those, right? We're getting back just five proprioceptive si signals from the hand. Why five? Why not five times three? So we're talking about the proprioceptive sensors now, right? So the tactile, the tactile we have 10. So we have one in the palm, one in the thumb, and two apiece in the fingers. So actually you do get some very detailed tactile information from the inner surface of your hand for very good reason, right? We're very sensitive in terms of touch on the inside part of our hand, not so much on the back of our hand because we tend not to grab objects with the back of our hands, right? You don't need tactile, tactile sensors in the middles of your fingers, so it's just the angle sensor and the proprioceptive. They right. So we have ten touch sensors in the hand, and we don't have one in the middle joint. You're right. So they're, they're assuming that ten is going to be enough, right? So you can feel things touching, or the robot can feel things touching the base of each finger and the tip of each finger, not the not the middle. Only five proprioceptive sensors in the hand. This one's a little trickier. Is it just each finger? Or it's just each finger, right? So basically, the robot is going to kind of do this, right? So when you close your finger, it's very hard for you to, uh, it's very hard for you to rotate the, your upper part of your finger relative to your middle, but not your middle relative to your base, right? They all tend to close together. So you, it's easy enough to just take five numbers, which is sort of the curvature of each finger. Right? That's really all you need, because that's all you can do. And as we're going to see in a moment when we, talk about the, uh, when we talk about the hand actuation, that's all this robot does as well. It can't independently move each uh, part of each finger. OK, so that's the sensor information. Uh, 1 through 22. So now let's have a look down at the math for a moment. We can see that we're going to define the behavior of the first 22 neurons using this equation here. Tau sub i, y dot sub i equals minus y sub i plus g upper i sub lowercase i. Where have you seen this before? Hopefully this isn't too intimidating now. You've seen this before. This is a CTRNN. It's got a slightly different mathematical form than what we've seen before, but we should be able to tease this out. What is yi dot representing here? We saw this before, I think, is dyi over dt. Same thing. What is y dot i telling us? Or what does it tell us about? the first 22 neurons? The value of the neuron. The, not just the value of the neuron, but... Is it the initial one? 
Not the initial value. Not the resting. Time. Remember your calculus, it actually is useful. You might not have thought so when you were taking calculus. Here's where it's useful. Is that that change in value? That change in value, right? So we're gonna we're gonna describe how y sub i, how these 22 neurons are changing their values over time, right? That's what calculus is all about. Change over time. What is this little guy doing? It's got a it's got a subscript of i, so we know each of the 22 neurons has its own tau. What does tau do? It affects the speed, right? So low tau values, you can mentally divide this side and this side by tau. Different values of tau will make the rate of change of that neuron faster or slower, right? Minus y sub i on the right-hand side, what is that telling us about how y i changes over time? What will y sub i tend to do over time? Go to zero. Go to zero, right? So if there's no external stimulation from these 22 sensors, the neurons will just decay down towards zero. This we haven't seen before. This is G with no, uh, with no subscript. This is the gain. They're setting a gain for all one number for all the 22 neurons. I think in this experiment, I think it's set to one, so it's actually not that important. What's II? Terrible notation here, but we'll have to use it. What is II representing? What do the two I's stand for? The input. The input to the IF neuron, right? So in the case of the first seven, II is the current angle of that joint. In the tactile sensors in the hand, II is the value of the touch sensor in that part of the hand, and so on. Right? Okay, so this equation describes how these 22 neurons are changing over time. Now let's have a look at neurons 23 through 48. Tell me about neurons 23 through 48. How are they changing over time? Let's break this down. They have tau again. So again, we know that evolution can change the rate of change of the internal and the output neurons. Same thing here. What is this term representing? Sigma y sub j plus beta sub j. It's the, the, the sigma is the activation function, right? So we're squashing the neuron's value. What is beta here? B is the hint. Bias. The bias, right? Remember that we can offset the default value of a neuron. So even if y sub j, when it's y sub i, decays to zero, when it outputs a value and influences another neuron, we can offset, or evolution can change its default value. Okay? So the output of neuron j is multiplied by the weight of the synapse that connects neuron j to neuron i. We sum that all up, and that influences how y i changes over time. Right? We've seen this several times before. Looks pretty familiar. Little tricky, a uh, little tricky change here is now that we're iterating j um, n through m, and n through m is different for different i's. So let's take this one piece at a time. So for i equals 23 through 30, so for the internal neurons, n equals 1 and m equals 30. What does that tell us about this neural network? What is influencing neuron 23? What is influencing neuron 30? All the uh, sensor neurons and all the internal Exactly, right? So 1 through 30 includes all the sensor neurons and all the hidden neurons, right? So if you take any given hidden neuron, you take the ith hidden neuron, there are 30 incoming edges, 30 incoming synapses to that hidden neuron. The 23 incoming, or sorry, the 22 incoming sensor values, sensor neuron values, and the eight uh, internal neurons including itself, right? So it's also connected to itself. Okay, let's have a look now at neurons 31 through 48. So that's the output layer. 
They're being influenced by 20, neurons 23 through 30, which is the internal neurons, right? So there's no direct connection from the internal neurons to the output neurons. We can see this by looking at the cartoon, but we can also see this by reading off the, the map, right? So I think this is a nice figure from this paper. Uh, again, if you get confused about neural networks, go back and have a look at this figure, because you can see most of the math in the picture and vice versa. Okay, so we've made it from the sensor layer to the output layer. Let's have a look at the actuators up here. We see that there are 14 arm actuators, but only seven arm joints. What's going on here? Shouldn't there be seven motor neurons for each of the seven joints? Why 14 rather than seven? This one's a little tricky. The clue here is that, again, they're trying to make an anthropomorphic robot. They're trying to make an arm that is pretty much as close to the human arm, well, not as close as possible, but pretty close. Is it dual axis? Dual axis, uh, close, not quite. So they assign two motor neurons to each joint. They're going to double them up. It's not actually clear from this picture. Why would they assign two neurons to each joint? They only need one. Is it just because you do apply a force when you go both ways? Ah, uh, you apply a force when you go both ways, right? So let's take our upper arm. I want to rotate my lower arm relative to my upper arm. How many muscle groups take care of that? I'll, I'll, there are, depending on which level, right? Let's go to the topmost level. There are two major groupings of muscles. Anybody know their anatomy? What are those two major muscle groups that allow me to do this, but also to do this? Bicep, tricep. Bicep and tricep, right? So muscles are like a rope. You can pull a rope, but you can never push a rope, right? So if I only had a bicep, I could do this just fine, but if I wanted to extend my arm again, there's no signals that my brain can send to my bicep to ever extend my arm again, right? I guess I could do this and let it flop back, but I can't do this, right? So the entire human body is built on the um, agonist, agonist, antagonist, the agonist and antagonistic system. So for every major uh, joint in your body, there are you at least two major muscle groups that are on opposite side of the major bones, right? One pulls on one side, which causes uh, extension, and then the other, this one relaxes, and the other one pulls, and you get extension, right? You can't push a rope. You can't push your bi bicep. All you can do is contract it. Okay, so that's exactly what they're simulating here, is for each of the seven joints, they have two motor neurons, and those motor neurons are changing their values over time, and the greater the value, the more that neuron is pushing the joint, or pulling the, sorry, pulling the joint in one direction. If the other motor neuron fires more strongly, it's pulling the joint in the other direction. So you can think of these two motor neurons as an antagonistic and agonist pair pulling on the joints. Simplest way is really just take the difference between these two values and that becomes the desired angle of the, the joint, right? Trying to be anthropomorphic here. Okay, this is strange. Neuron 45 and 46, just two motor neurons for the hand, which has a whole bunch of joints. So now we have the opposite problem. We have too many joints and too little motor neurons. What do you think just these two motor neurons are doing? Is that how the tendons work? Contracting tendons? Uh, it's contracting tendons, but which tendons? We've got all these joints in the hand and just two motor neurons. One for the thumb and one for the finger. Could, could be, right? They might have done the thumb and the fingers differently. They're going to use these two motor neurons. I'll give you a hint. They're going to use these two motor neurons as an agonist antagonistic pair again. Just, just for motion of grabbing and grabbing and opening. That's it, right? So they're going to use these pair of, of uh, uh, motor neurons 46 and 40, uh, 45 and 46, close, open. That's all the robot can do. It cannot individually move its finger and thumb. Right? Okay, 
Finally, we get to the interesting part of this neural network, 47 and 48. Simplest thing to do here would be to say, OK, we're going to drop this neural network. We're going to drop this neural network into the robot, place it in front of an object, let the robot do its thing. When it's finished, we're going to read off 47 and 48. And let's decide that if the value of 47 is greater than the value of 48, that's the robot telling us it's a, it's a sphere. If 48 is greater than 47, it's telling us it's an ellipsoid. That would kind of be the simplest thing to, to do, right? Whichever of these two neurons has a higher value, that's it. So one categorization neuron for each category. It's not what they did. They actually did something more complicated, which we'll look at in a moment. Why did they abandon that obviously simpler approach? Maybe they wanted for future tests to see how round or like how much more of an ellipsoid it was compared to sphere. They could. So they could extend this to say, don't just tell us whether it's a sphere or an ellipsoid. Tell us the ratio of the major to minor axis. How much of an ellipsoid is it? They didn't do that here. They're still just going to train the robot to tell us, is it a sphere or an ellipsoid? Yeah, because it's still not, that's not a definite way to determine whether or not the robot sphere and ellipse, you're just setting values and saying, if this is happening, you think it's a sphere? Maybe. Maybe that's how we do it. Who knows? It's probably not how we do it. Why not? Remember the experiment with that little uh, anthropomorphic robot that was shaking the block up and down, back and forth? We came across a similar issue there. What was the issue? What was the problem? There's a problem if we went with this, if we got lazy and went with this simple solution of just saying each neuron corresponds to a category. 47, neuron 47 is spheres and 48 is ellipsoids. Overfitting? Not quite overfitting. Well, like if you wanted to go with different objects, then you have to start making new combinations. So it's not scalable. It's not scalable. There it is, right? So we throw in cubes, rectangular solids, soft objects, hard objects, friends, foe, edible berries, uh, uh, dangerous berries. How many categories are you capable of, right? Again, it's hard to enumerate that because categories depend on the environment, but probably millions. And it would be a terrible waste of neural real estate if every neuron was assigned to every possible category you could ever learn. It's not a very scalable approach. Right? Even if we wanted to train this robot to distinguish between 100 different categories, we'd need 100 categorization neurons and all the other weights and tiles that go along with those. And we would have a massive genome, and it would take evolution a long time to train that robot to to categorize all these hundred objects, right? So it's not a, it's a simple solution, easy to implement in code, but not a very scalable solution. So we're going to look at a solution that's more complex from an implementation point of view, but is, as you'll see, more scalable. OK, let's see how this works. OK, so what they did is they started by saying in each of the 16 trials, remember there's, each neural network is exposed to 16 conditions. In each trial E, the agent is going to represent the experienced object, either the sphere, S, or the ellipsoid, D, by associating it to a rectangle, I'll just say RS or RD, whose vertices are defined by these coordinates. So we're actually now going to switch to a geometric interpretation of, uh, of categorization. You'll notice that. Uh, each in the math there, there are two coordinates. You can think of those as x and y. So we can actually draw what these two neurons are doing, 47 and 48. We can draw them inside a two-dimensional plane. And let's actually see how they're going to use neuron 47 and 48 to draw this picture. What does this term represent? Let's work from the inside out. We just saw this term. What does it represent? It's the bias and the sigma represents the, Jack, you said it earlier. Yeah, 
the activation function, right? So this term as a whole is representing the output of neuron 47. Now where there's a T next to it, what is the T you probably represent? Time, time step, right? So it's the value of neuron 47 at the tth time step. We're going to look at the value of neuron 47 at multiple time steps that are going to range between 0.95 uppercase T and uppercase T. What do you think that notation means? What time span are they looking at? What do you think the uppercase T represents? The final time step? The final time step, right? So the robot is moving for 500 time steps or 1,000. doesn't say here. It doesn't matter. So uppercase T is probably the final time step. So what is this time span representing? The last 5%. The last 5% of the evaluation period. We're going to let the robot actively manipulate the object. And during the last 5% of the time steps, we're going to ask the robot, is it a sphere or an ellipsoid? We're taking the minimum value of this neuron over that, uh, over that time. We're also taking the minimum value of neuron 48 over that, that time. So we're looking, and we're going to look at the max as well. So before we talk about the min and max here, let's actually draw this. Let's imagine that the value of neuron 47 is this at 0.95 uppercase T. So just when we start recording, that neuron is at this value. And let's imagine that neuron 48 is at this particular value at that time instant. Right? So we connect these two together. This point represents the value of neuron, the output value of neuron 47 and 48 at 0.95 uppercase T at that time. Right? Now we go to the next time step. The robot moves a little bit. The sensor signals change. The sensor values flow upward into the internal layer and up to the actuation layer, which causes the robot to move a little bit. And now, neuron 47 and 48 also change their value a little bit. Next time step, next time step, next time step, next time step, and we get something like this, right? We get a trajectory in two-dimensional space, which shows us how neurons 47 and 48 are changing their values during the last 5% of the evaluation period. I want to go backwards in time. It's not backwards in time, right? Oh, so okay. the yeah. point, this is 0.95t, this is, let's say, 0.96t, this is 0.97t, right? Each point represents a different point in time. And the position of that point represents the values of those two neurons at that time. Yeah. OK, so there's no backward and forward. In, actually, there is backward. This is forward in time, and this is backwards in time. This would be right. really cool to look at in three dimensions, where the z-axis is uh, No, we're, we're just, we're just going to represent the position along this vector as time. Right? So this is actually, for those of you that are interested, this is a tangential thing. This is called a phase diagram. A phase diagram is a way to show how, in this, if we have a two-dimensional plot, it shows how two values are changing over time. If we added a third axis here, we could it represent, if we were to watch this trajectory moving through three-dimensional space, it would be showing us how three values are changing over time. So time is not one of the axes here. It's the values that are changing. Movement along this line is either forward or backward in time. Make sense? OK. So what we're really looking at is a phase diagram of these two, two neurons. OK. So um, what are we going to do? We're going to try and create this rectangle R sub s here. And R sub s has, uh, is a rectangle which is defined by the minimum and maximum of neuron 47 and 48. So let's find the minimum value of 47. The minimum value is going to be the leftmost point on this picture. So there's the minimum of 47. The maximum of 47 is the right-hand edge. That's this line here. We also need the minimum of 48, so the lowest most point of this trajectory. 
which is this point here. And we also want the maximum of neuron 48, which is up here. There we go. Right? So we've now defined a rectangle that has at its lower left vertex is defined as the minimum of 47 and 48. And the upper right corner of this rectangle is the maximum value of 47 and 48. Right? What I haven't told you yet is whether this hypothetical trajectory was generated when the robot was in the presence of the sphere or the ellipsoid. We don't know, right? This is just the robot did its thing in the presence of an object. Let's assume for the moment that this uh, robot was in the presence of uh, a sphere. So this rectangle then becomes R sub S, the rectangle defined uh, the rectangle that was created by 47 and 48 when in the presence of the sphere, and we have a final subscript here, E, the sphere during the eth trial. Remember that there are 16 trials, right? So that's R sub E. Let's take exactly the same neural network, put it back inside the robot, put its arm back to the initial position A, remove the sphere, and now put an ellipsoid under its palm, and turn the robot back on again, what is 47 and 48 going to do now? Look it's going to look different, right? I don't know how it's going to look different. Uh, I don't have any other color chalk here, I apologize. So let's assume that now it does something like this, right? We again take the minimum of 47 and 48, and the maximum of 47 and 48, which gives us a new rectangle. And this is the rectangle when the robot was in the presence of the ellipsoid during the EF trial. Right? OK, so now let's step back from this example here. Remember that we take each neural network and expose it to 16 trials, eight trials with the sphere and eight trials with the ellipsoid. What would this picture look like? If we continued on, how many rectangles would we have? Not eight rectangles. 16 rectangles, right? We'd have eight R sub S's and eight R sub D's. So imagine now that there are 16 rectangles drawn up here on the board. We're going to define two last variables, CS and CD. CS, I'll just draw one more R sub S. So here's one R sub S. Let's imagine here's another R sub S. C sub S, the C is going to stand for classified as a sphere. We're going to place a bounding box around all the eight R sub S's. And that's going to be the territory that belongs to the spheres. If we have... Uh, two R sub D's, we place a bounding box around those eight R sub, uh, R sub D's, and that gives us the category for the ellipsoid. So at the end of this uh, eval 16 evaluations of this one robot, we get two big rectangles, C, S, and C, D, which represent the robot's thinking about the spheres and the ellipsoids. Remember that the robot still doesn't know which is which, right? We are the one that's drawing these bounding boxes around the robot's behavior. We want the robot to be able to distinguish between spheres and, uh, spheres and ellipsoids. More than that, we also want it to reduce within category differences. We want it to feel similar things when it's in the presence of a sphere, and feel similar things when it's in the presence of an ellipsoid, but we want it to magnify between category differences. We want it to feel different things when it's in the presence of either a sphere or an ellipsoid. The last thing, which we haven't talked about yet, is the fitness function. So in order to build up an intuition for what this fitness function is going to look like, what would you like C sub S and C sub D to look like? You want them to be separate? You want them to be separate, right? They shouldn't overlap. If the C sub S and C sub D overlaps, you create a random neural network, you create C S and C D and they overlap, what does that tell you about the robot's felt experience? 
It's the can't tell, right? The sphere feels like an ellipsoid and vice versa. Okay, so now we're ready to tackle the last piece here, which is the fitness function. This is a relatively complex fitness function because this is a relatively challenging task. The fitness function is equal to the sum of two fitness terms, F1 and F2. You can see that F1, we're going to take the average over all 16 trials. Right? And it's 1 minus DE over D max. Let's start with DE. DE is the Euclidean distance between the object and the center of the palm. And D max is the maximum possible distance that the robot can get its palm away from the object. So what is this ratio telling us? What does DE over D max give us? What's the range of values for this fraction or this ratio? 0 to 1, right? We're taking 1 minus this fraction, which again should be telling you something. What does 1 minus mean? What are we trying to get the robot to do? Maximize or minimize this fraction? Minimize it, right? We want it to be as close to 0 as possible. What does 0 mean for this ratio? What is the robot doing? It's touching it, right? There's no distance between the palm. should really say between the palm and the surface of the object, right? So why include F1? So that the robot is actually interacting with the object. So the robot is actively acting with the, with the object, right? Imagine we try to ask, ask the robot to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids, and every time we put an object nearby, it went like this. It can't see. The only information it can get about the objects is in the palm of the hand, right? So we're adding in F1 is a scaffold, right? We've talked about this a few times before, or incremental evolution. We're going to train it to do F1 before we even allow it to, to tackle F2, right? You'll notice that it gets an F2 of 0 if F1 is less than 1. So we're literally telling the robot, you have to walk before you run, right? Don't try and distinguish between these objects if you're not even touching them. Figure out how to keep your palm in contact with, with the object. Okay. All right, now we're ready to tackle F2. So again, we see 1 minus this fraction, which immediately tells us what are we trying to do with the fraction. Minimize it. We're going to try and minimize it. All right, let's have a look at the uh, numerator. The numerator is the area of CS intersection CD. What does that mean? How much the two rectangles in are overlap. Exactly, right? So in this example here, there's zero overlap. So area CS intersection CD is zero. It's a good, good thing, right? OK, we're dividing by the minimum area of the two bounding boxes. Why? The smaller the rectangle, the less ambiguity there will be. But so why don't we just have one minus area CS intersection CD? Why do we even need to normalize it here? Who cares? You can move down the size. You, you want to keep a value between zero and one. Exactly. We want to keep a value between zero and one. There's no bound on the area of these these bounding boxes, right? One neural network might actually give a bounding box like this, right? Another one might give a bounding box like this, right? So the amount of overlap between the robot that produces big bounding boxes and the amount of overlap between the robot that produces small bounding boxes, this one shouldn't be, this one shouldn't be punished for having more overlap because it just happens to have bigger bounding boxes. But we don't really care about the size, so we're going to normalize out the total size, and we're going to take the minimum of these two areas, because if we have two bounding boxes, one smaller than the other, right, then the total amount of, of the, the total amount of overlap is bounded by the smaller of the two, right? So by taking the minimum of those two, we ensure that that fraction, like the one in F1, is always going to range between zero and one. This is the worst possible thing you can do, right? You get the ratio is one. There's complete uh, intersection. 
And the best thing you can do is this, right? Zero overlap. OK, so now we're going to evolve, uh, evolve these robots. And I'm just going to skip to slide 7. I'll go back to slide 6 in a moment. So here we go. They did three evolutionary trials. And they ran each one using a genetic algorithm for 500 generations. How did these three runs do? Did the, did the, the robots in these three runs succeed at active categorical perception? Yes, how do you know? It's getting the maximum fitness value of for most of the, for most of the uh, second half of the um. Exactly, right? So all this work we did to put in a little to put in some math to normalize things is now paying off because we know what the maximum value is. The best possible thing the robot can do is get a fitness of two. Right? So now just at a glance, even without looking at the behaviors yet, we can see that in all three runs, the robots evolved the ability to distinguish between spheres and ellipsoids. Right? It took run number two a little while to get there, but it did. OK, I've been putting off the fun part now. Right? How does the robot actually do this? OK, so like before, we're going to uh, watch a single evolved neural network. We're going to play that neural network 16 times. And as as you watch this video, you can watch over here and you'll see the robot actively manipulate the object. And the investigators made a nice little, uh, a nice little widget over here, which is they've got sphere on the left, ellipsoid on the right, and this little blue arrow. At the moment, this little blue arrow is pointing up between the two. What does that mean? The robot doesn't know yet, right? When this video starts, the ellipsoid is going to drop to point at sphere or point at ellipsoid, how did the investigators know when they were making this video when to draw the arrow pointing to sphere or ellipsoid? How did they know when the robot had decided, again, quote unquote, decided, yes, this is a sphere or an ellipsoid? When the line was in the proper rectangle. Absolutely, right? So 47, neurons 47 and 48 start here. It's outside of either C, outside of, no, I've lost my track here. This is CS and this is CD, right? So it doesn't know, right? The robot starts moving. A line comes here, passes inside of C sub S. The robot says, aha, this feels like a sphere, right? Or it starts moving and passes into C sub D, and it says, aha, this feels like an ellipsoid. So they're watching the values of neurons 47 and 48 as the robot is behaving, and they're going to draw this blue rectangle, uh, this blue trying um, arrow accordingly. I don't know if I can play this in browser, uh, in PowerPoint. Let's see. No, of course not. Hold on. It is this one. Okay. Uh, I want to make sure you can see the caption here. OK, here we go. How did the robot do? Did it get all eight correct? You don't know, right? So this is a great video because it shows how hard this task actually is, right? So you're looking at these objects. It's hard to tell, right, whether it's actually a sphere or an ellipsoid. They made this really hard for the robot, right? These objects are very close to one another. But this robot is getting all eight correct. Yes, Kelly. Why didn't they make it easy on you? Yeah. Why didn't they? Well, I'm going to, there, let's, why didn't they make it easy on you? Because they don't care. They care. They made it, they made it hard on you on purpose, actually. 
right? So this is often the problem with AI, right? Once the machine does it, we say, oh yeah, that was easy, right? We could have done that. It's hard, it's hard to remember that actually some of these things are quite tricky because thinking about thinking is misleading, right? If I were to put a sphere and, a, and an ellipsoid in front of you, you'd do fine and say, why are we even bothering spending an hour talking about this? It's a trivial task, right? Not really. It's actually quite, quite challenging. Okay, so that was the evolved neural network getting 8 out of 8 correct with initial position A. Same neural network now, but now they start the robot's hand and arm in a different initial position. Now it's a little bit easier to see ellipsoid and sphere, I think. Yeah. Oh. You'll notice that the arrow was flickering back and forth a few times here. What, why? What's happening in the robot's mind? Um, well, since the rectangles are specific to the previous angle that it's used to, maybe the new angle is making a time loop a bit more for a second than it took over. These may not have been the objects that it saw during evolution, right? The investigators might have rotated the objects slightly different. Let's be specific about what's going on in the robot's brain during these moments when it's unsure. The, the line isn't necessarily, it might not either be, it might not be entering CD or CS at all, it might just be a completely tangent line to the box. It could be, right, it's outside the box, but when it's flickering back and forth, sphere, no, no, it's ellipsoid, no, it's, I'm sure it's sphere, what's happening? It's going between each one, right? So it's not sure. It says it's a sphere. No, it's an ellipsoid. No, no, I'm sure it's a sphere, right? So it's actually over this short time window at the end of evaluation, it's getting this ambiguous signal, right? Because, again, these objects are very close to one another. Okay, tell me about the robot strategy. How is it manipulating these objects to tell the difference between them? It'll roll it towards it. Arm. Yep. What does that tell it? Well, it tells it the difference between the sphere and ellipsoid, but how? It's really hard to think about how a robot will think, but it, it looks like it's wrapping the ball, and when it rotates it towards itself, it drags its fingers along the tip, along the edge to see the curvature. Yep. You'll notice that the fingers are draped over the edges as it's rolling, right? So again, it's very hard for us to say how the robot is determining whether it's sphere or ellipsoid, but it has something to do probably with the difference in curvatures of the fingers, right? I thought it was doing that with the other one, but it seemed like with the other arm angle, it was a lot easier to do this. Possibly, right? So it's not always the same, right? The, the resulting motion is not just based on what the robot commanded the motors to do, but the object and the environment and the initial arm position and so on, right? So tricky, but doable. Okay. Okay, so now, and again, this is one of the things I love about this experiment, we can dive inside the robot's mind and literally see what it's thinking. <clears throat> and thanks to the experimenters choosing just two neurons, we can produce a nice, clean, two-dimensional image of what it's thinking. Now, like in the minimal cognition experiments, they took the single best evolved neural network, and they now exposed it not to uh, 16 object placements, but a total of, um, let's see, 180 rotations of the sphere and 180 rotations of the ellipsoid, right? So in the case of the ellipsoid, the 180 rotations were this, 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 all the way around to 180. In the case of the sphere, it was this, 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 same thing over and over again. Let's go to the sphere for a moment. So what do the gray small rectangles represent? R, S. 
R sub s, right? So those are each of the individual 180 exposures. And the large dotted gray box, C sub C, C, S, right? That's the category. If in the case of the 180 rotations of the sphere, there's no rotation because spheres are rotationally symmetric, why do we get these two different groupings? The two initial positions of the arm, right? So that gives us the two clumps. But why do we get? Why don't we just get two? Why don't we get ninety small, uh, small rectangles in this group and ninety small rectangles in this group, and they're all sitting right on top of one another? Why is there this spread? Well, they're all make similar but not exact uh, motions on each uh, generation. Why does it make similar? It clearly makes similar but not identical motions. Why not? It's the same neural network. Same sphere, what's different? Genome. The genomes are the same. Remember, this is one neural network, so we're not looking at different robots. Same robot, same sphere. Is it consistently trying to find the most efficient way to determine? No, the, the, robot is, the robot is deterministic. It does the same thing, right? The sensor, whatever the sensors report, that's what the robot does. Where is this difference coming from? Uh, the first 95% are different, probably, because the last 5% are different, but why are the first 95% different? I haven't actually told you yet, but maybe you have some experience with physics engines. Um, is the ball being placed in the same way every time? Exactly. So, well, it's being placed differently in these two different treatments, but in initial position A, it's always being put in exactly the same position. Okay. Yep. So a lot of different joints and motors to round. Rounding errors? Could be rounding error. They're, they might have put a little bit of noise on purpose in the simulation, just a little bit of inconsistency, right? And that's enough to, pr to produce this, this spread. Why do we get such a larger spread in the case of the ellipsoid? Why is the black bounding box larger than the gray bounding box? There's nothing in the fitness function that said anything about what the sizes should be. The rotation of you get more varied experiences, physical experiences, from the rotations of the ellipsoid than you do from the sphere. What is the robot thinking in this case? It's an ellipsoid. It thinks it's an ellipsoid. Is it an ellipsoid? Well, oh wait, no, it thinks it's a sphere, but it is an ellipsoid. It thinks it's a sphere because this is inside here, but the fact that it's drawn black means it's an ellipsoid, right? So it made a mistake. We've seen that before, right? So maybe, well, actually, definitely, this robot got all 16 out of the 16 trials correct during evolution. We then took that evolved neural network and played it back in 360 new conditions. It got almost all of them right, but there were a couple that it got, it got wrong, right? So we have a somewhat intelligent machine that can distinguish between these objects, but it's not perfect. Okay. Uh, here is uh, these bounding boxes in one experiment. Here is the second best evolved controller from run two, best evolved controller from run two, third best. So uh, one, two, three, four different evolved robots. Do these robots think in the same way? Definitely not, right? The boxes are different sizes. They're in different relative positions. But they do think the same way in one way. What is it? Draw boxes. They draw boxes. Well, we're forcing them to do that. That's true. They have chosen, quote unquote, to think similarly in one way. What is it? Most of the... Spheres have higher, I guess you use like 48 than 47. Uh, the, that's true. The gray boxes are all above the yeah. black ones. That's interesting. There may be a reason for that. I'm not sure. Possibly. What else? Uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the gray boxes are much smaller than the black ones. The gray boxes are much smaller than the black ones, right? So that ten, and again, that makes sense, right? For all these robots, generally, the experience of manipulating an ellipsoid is more diverse than manipulating a sphere. 
you remember that old philosophical question about when I see red, I might actually be seeing green? You might be seeing something else, right? Hard to know in our case whether that's true. In the robot's case, you can start to get at that question, right? When these different robots experience an ellipsoid, what do they really experience, right? What does it feel like? We can start to get at that question. We got one, let's take one minute. We're at uh, 9.45, we'll take one more minute. What happens if we went back and redid this experiment and we wanted to train it to distinguish between spheres, ellipsoids, and cubes? How would you have to change the experiment? Would we have to add a 49th neuron? Just uh, draw a new box from where there's the cubes. Just draw a new box and change your fitness function accordingly. So now we'd have CS, CD, and CC for cube, right? Let's add rectangular solids. Let's add uh, uh, objects that are rough, objects that are smooth. How many possible different objects could we pack in to this experiment so that the robot could still successfully distinguish between all of them? Until there's a rounding error. Until there's a rounding error, right? Probably quite a few. So again, if you're shopping for a final project, maybe you don't need to make something as complex as this arm, but no one's been able to ta answer that question yet. It'd be interesting to know the answer to it. All right, we'll leave things there. Um, you're working on assignment seven or deliverable two, and you have a quiz due tonight. Thanks very much.